to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ let all things be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40. Welcome to our study of church order. In this series of topical lessons, we're going to be discussing the nature of God, church order, and various topics that will encourage us to live faithfully to God and to live in accord with the teaching of the New Testament. As we think today about church order, we need to first ask, what is the church? Too many times we get the idea that the church is the building or the church is when we assemble only, but in reality, the church is the people. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, the Apostle Paul said, You are the body of Christ, speaking to Christians, and members individually, one of another. And so what is the church? The church is the collective group of Christians, the saved. Acts chapter 7, verses 48 through 50 tells us, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord. And so we're not talking about keeping the grass mowed. We're not talking about keeping up the building. We're talking about us organizing our life and especially organizing what we do in worship and salvation correctly. For church order to be accomplished, it has to begin with some fundamental teachings on the individual level. You see, God himself is a God of order and a God of design. You look at creation and it's composed of order. Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Out of chaos and disorder, God brought together and, and formed this world. Psalm 19 1 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. The firm it shows his handiwork. You look at the human body and it's designed in, a, in an orderly way. Everything works together. Nature is codependent upon other parts of nature and it all works so intricately together. And thus, for us to please God, we must excel in church order. Notice again what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40. The Bible simply says, let all things be done decently and in order. Well, let's think for just a few moments then about areas we should strive to have church order in, and we may begin a little differently than you might think. For church order to exist, I've got to make sure my life as a member of the Lord's church is lived properly, that my life is in order before our worship and before other areas can be in order. Well, what does it mean for my life? to be lived in an orderly fashion, it means first and foremost that I must live for Jesus Christ every day. Jesus must be the first thing. He must be the main goal and the main priority in the life that I live. Matthew 6, Jesus taught us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, food, shelter, and clothing, will be provided for you. If my life's going to be in order, I've got to realize Jesus and the kingdom must come first above all else, above my job, above my family, above recreation. Christ and the kingdom must be at the top of the list. It only makes sense that that's the case. For Jesus asks a compelling question in Mark 8, 36 and 37. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If I gain this whole world, if I've got everything I ever wanted and I die and go to hell, what good would that be? Sometimes we miss the real purpose in life if we're not looking closely. Solomon missed it for a little while. Solomon sought meaning in building things and projects and women and wine and, and all kind of things in life. 
But then he realized what life was all about. And here's what he said. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13, the wise sage Solomon says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. What's life all about? How can I live an orderly life? Fear God, number one. And secondly, keep his commandments. Respect God as God and do what he says. Isaiah 43 and verse 7, God said, Everyone who's called by my name, whom I created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 echoes those sentiments. Whatever we do, whether we eat or whether we drink, we're to do all to the glory of God. And thus, as Paul said in Galatians 2, verse 20, we've got to die to self. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so think about your own life. Are you living an orderly life by putting the Lord first? Jesus said, be faithful until death. Then I'll give you the crown of life. Paul taught us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Romans 12 verse 1, we're taught to let the love of Christ compel us and to live for Christ every day. And friend, I want you to see what Jesus said he demands of us, what Jesus asks of us in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. What does it mean to live an orderly life? Look at Luke 9, verse 23. The Lord said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, Take up his cross daily and follow me. To live orderly, I first must live for Jesus every day. Secondly, I must abstain from this old world. The world is sure not where we want to put our hope. For James 4 verse 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. I cannot live with one foot in the world, one foot in the church, half-heartedly for God and half-heartedly for the world. God doesn't want it that way. People have tried that in the Bible. You remember Acts chapter 5? Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted to live in the world, and yet they wanted that praise from God and his people. Both of them died because they didn't put first things first. Think about Demas. Paul said, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Think about Balaam. Balaam made one of the greatest statements in the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 22. I'll neither turn to the left hand nor to the right. I'll only do what God says. And yet 10 chapters later, he dies in battle against the people of God. Why is that? Balaam let the world suck him in. He let the world drown out his desire to do the will of God. Here's what God says. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord. You remember the rich farmer in Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21? He had a great crop year and began to say to his soul, You've got many goods laid up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry in essence. Do you remember what God said to that man? You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. Then whose things will those be whom you have required or acquired? That man wasn't living orderly because he let the world conform him instead of being conformed into the image of Christ. Here's how Christians ought to think. I want you to notice the words of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. The scripture says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. What's my mindset? I'm not going to fellowship with it. I'm not going to be in accord with it. I'm not going to go where they go. I'm not going to do what they do. We need to love not the world nor the things that is in the world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Unlike the rich young ruler, we need to be able to give it up. Do you remember the rich young ruler? Mark chapter 10, he comes to Jesus. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, keep the commandments. All those I've done for my childhood. One thing you lack. Sell what you have, give to the poor, come follow me. Mark 10, 17 is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. That man went away sorrowful, for he had great riches. He let this old world keep him from living an orderly life that fulfilled the will of God. Now, why is it that we must not get caught up in the world? There are many reasons, 
But I want you to notice why according to 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 12. Notice what Peter says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Friend, we need not get caught up in the world, because the earth and all that in it is one day going to be burned up. If my hope is in all the, in this world, if that's what I'm living for, and one day the world's going to cease to exist, what happens to my hope? There is no hope in that. And so living an orderly life means that I put Christ first. Living an orderly life means that I do not get caught up in the world. And living an orderly life means I must see sin as God sees it. God hates sin. Isaiah 30 verse 1, it is something God thinks of as a defilement. Psalm 24 verses 3 and 4, the one who can approach God has clean hands and a pure heart. Sin doesn't keep our hands clean. It dirties them. For Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says, Our sins are like filthy rags. We're like filthy rags when we have sin in our life. You see, it's sin that separates me from God. Isaiah spoke about this in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. He said, The Lord's ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. God doesn't have a hearing problem. The Lord's arm's not shortened that he cannot save. God doesn't have a defective arm that he can't save. What's the problem then? Your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. Do we see sin as severing the relationship with God? There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 verse 10, all who are in sin, do we see that as unrighteousness? Habakkuk chapter 1 verses 12 through 13 tells us, God is of pure eyes, then behold evil. He cannot look upon wickedness. Do we see sin as something God has to turn away from? Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4, the scripture says, The soul who sins shall surely die. Do we see sin as that which will kill us spiritually? And oh, how the psalmist thought about sin in Psalm 38 verse 4, and he said, My iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me to bear. Do we see people in sin as drowning in it, suffering the weight of it? Romans 6 23, the wages of sin is death. Now, I want you to think about what was said in the book of Numbers concerning sin and how God and how we ought to see sin. Look at Numbers 32 and verse 23. The scripture says, If you do not do so, take note. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Do we see sin as something we can't escape? Sometimes we think, well, oh, that's sin, and you know, it's bad, but we'll never really get caught. Not true. Your sin will find you out, and the way of the transgressor is hard. And so to live an orderly life, I've got to seek the kingdom first. I've got to make sure that I don't get caught up in the world, and I've got to hate sin and see sin as God sees it. But once we then decide to live personally in an orderly fashion, how do we organize the church, the collective body, orderly? Well, first, there must be order when it comes to church authority. We've got to have unity. We've got to have agreement on what is God's final authority today. You see, the Bible teaches God and His Son have all authority today. God is the author of mankind. Genesis 1:26. God said, let us make man in our image. And thus God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living being. Genesis 2, 7. Since God is the author of mankind, he has the right to have all authority. But as we think about authority, let's also realize the Son of God, Jesus Christ, has all authority today. Notice what the Lord said in Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus said, all, and Jesus came to spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. If Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, how much does that leave for me and you? How much does it leave for the Pope? How much does it lead for some synod or council or, or some board of deacons or something of that nature or elders? 
God has all authority in matters of doctrine, and thus we must submit to him. Jesus is still the head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And so to, to have the church in order, we've got to understand authority begins with God and his son. God has given us his authority in the Bible. The Bible is where we find God's authority today. God hasn't left it a mystery. God hasn't just left it up to everybody's whim and desire. God has clearly told us, here's where my will resides. Jeremiah 37 verse 17 and Romans 5 verse 4, a great question is asked. Is there any word from the Lord? What do the scriptures say? And John 2 verse 5 teaches us we've got to seek that. Jesus' mother said to the servants when he's about to fill the water pots, some sage, some very good advice. Whatever he, Jesus, says to you, do it. If the Bible is our authority and if whatever Jesus says we must do it, friend, we've got to make sure we look to the Bible. And here's the good news. If you look to this book, if you look to the pages of the Bible, you won't be led astray for it contains everything we need. Look at 2 Peter 1 verse 3. The scripture says concerning the Bible, as God's divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. What's the good news in saying the Bible is God's authority? This book has everything you need for life, to live the best life, and for godliness. This book is inspired of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. This book is absolute truth. John 17, 17. And that truth will make you free. John 8, 32. And thus the Bible is God's authority. While elders of the local congregation have authority in matters of option and matters of expediency, we need to realize that the Bible has all authority in matters of doctrine. Yes, Hebrews 13, 17 says we're to submit to and obey the elders, but only in matters of functionality, matters of expediency, matters of accomplishing the will of God on a local level. God still has authority in matters of doctrine. And so first, we've got to ask, where's the authority? Secondly, we must realize that we've got to have order in the doctrine which we teach. Church doctrine, the doctrine found in the New Testament, must be orderly. And thus, orderly doctrine demands unity in doctrine. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17, the Apostle Paul said that he taught the same thing in all the congregations. Well, if Paul in the New Testament taught the same thing in all the congregations, how we need to do exactly the same today. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. There is but one faith, Ephesians 4 verse 4. We can read and understand God's will, Ephesians 3 verse 4, and thus we've got to strive to have that oneness. I want you to notice what Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. Here's the prayer of the Lord. Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. If the church is going to be what God wants it to, Jesus said they've got to be one. Why is there so much chaos in the religious world? Because we're not striving for the same doctrine they had in the New Testament. We've let human ideas, we've let bias, we've let centuries of human tradition invade the purity of New Testament Christianity. You know, order and doctrine also demands that we must defend the faith against ungodly doctrine. Again, Ephesians 5.11 says we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Jesus wasn't afraid to defend the purity of God's doctrine. For in Mark 12, verse 24, Jesus said to the Sadducees, You do therefore greatly err, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. There's nothing wrong. In fact, it's right to defend, and it's orderly to defend the truth. Now, think about this. The words of Jude 3, don't they command all of us? to do exactly that. Notice what Jude said in verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, 
I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. We must contend. What's that word mean? We must fight. We must do battle. We must exert great energy to make sure the cause of Christ is not castigated by an ungodly and sinful world. Well, if that be the case, then let's think about some doctrines for just a minute that we need to have order and unity on. We need to have order when it comes to the oneness of the Lord's church. There are a host of religious people, and sadly, in sometimes inside the body of Christ, people don't want to come to the conclusion that God says there's only one church. Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church singular, possessive. Jesus is the founder. He's the owner. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11, no other foundation. Can any man may lay except that which is laid, which is Jesus? He's the head of that church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And Paul says that church is the body and Ephesians 4 verse 4 says this, there is one body. If the church is the body and there's only one body, how many churches are there? Well, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 tells us, By one spirit we're all baptized into one body. We know that denominationalism, division, is against the will of God. Paul said that he wrote because there were divisions. Some said they were of Paul. Some said they were of Paulus. Some said they were of Cephas. And Paul said, Let there be no divisions among you. Now here's the clarity of which God points out the fact that there's just one body. Notice the emphasis of 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 20. The scripture says, But now indeed there are many members, watch this, yet but one body. There are many members, but just one body. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of people who have obeyed the gospel who have been baptized for the remission of their sins, but there's only one church. That's all God ever intended. And if our doctrine is going to be orderly, we've got to proclaim that. Secondly, for our doctrine to be orderly, we must preach and teach baptism for the remission of sins. We live in a world where the majority of religious people are taught that baptism, yeah, it's something good to do. It's something you ought to do because Jesus did it. You can be saved now and be baptized two weeks later. Friends, you just don't find that in the New Testament. The Bible clearly teaches baptism is something you do before you're saved. It is the point in which we contact the blood of Jesus. Think about what Paul was told. Acts 22, 16, Saul was told, Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What point were Paul's sins, Saul's sins washed away? the point of baptism. John 3 verses 3 through 5, Jesus said, a man is born of water and spirit. Unless he's born of water and spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. I can't get in the kingdom. That kingdom which is ultimately going to heaven unless I've born of water. 1 Peter 3 21 makes it so clear. Baptism does now also save us. Listen carefully. If the Bible says baptism saves us, how dare anyone say baptism isn't essential? Acts 2.38, Peter preached that. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. We are baptized so that, in order that, the purpose being that our sins can be washed away. Now, are we saying we earn our salvation? Of course not. But must I meet the conditions of God to receive the free gift? In any common thinking person's mind, that's logical. If a free gift is given, there's still going to be conditions to get that gift, to access it. That's all believing and repenting and baptizing are, being baptized are. Now, let's see just how plain this is. Look in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 with me. Notice what Jesus said concerning baptism. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Belief and baptism are both essential to salvation. Third doctrine then that we must proclaim to be in order with the teaching of Christ is that instrumental music is sinful in worship to God and is not found in the New Testament. 
Now remember, we're living under the law of Christ today. The Bible teaches we're under the new covenant, Matthew 26, 28. That being the case, here's what God tells us to do. Ephesians 5, 19 says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. We're to sing. We're to sing with the spirit and the understanding. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. Uh, Matthew 26, 30. The disciples sung a hymn and went out. Is anyone happy? Let him sing. James 5, verses 13 through 15. And so as we think about doctrine that is in order with the teaching of Christ, Singing is what God asks for today. You won't find one instance in the New Testament of anybody glorifying God with a piano, with an organ, with a guitar, on drums or a banjo or whatever you might think of. God said make melody in your heart. And if we're really going to be the kind of people God wants us to, if we're going to have order, God wants our worship to be orderly. I want you to think about the words of Hebrews 12, verse 28 and 29, and notice specifically that our worship has to be acceptable. Notice what Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 says. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God, worship God, serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. I've got to serve, I've got to worship God acceptably. How do I do that? By doing what the Bible says. And so we ask you today, is your life, first of all, being lived orderly? Are you seeking first Christ? Are you staying away from the world? Are you seeing sin as God sees it? And then secondly, do we realize this book is the final authority and we must say and do only that which God says and God tells us to do? If you've never obeyed the gospel more than anything, we want to invite you to become a Christian. Hear the word of God. Believe that Jesus is God's son. Repent of those things in your life that are not right. Make that good confession and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And may God help each of us to live a life decently and in order that glorifies God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.